First, a warning. As far as offensive words go, you are now entering a hard hat area. We're going to be unabashed in this. I am talking to you about a very particular word, a very powerful word, a very see you next Tuesday word. A word that is still so offensive that the funders of this event would only let me talk about it if we censored it on the slides. <laughs> Which rather proves my point, don't you think? I love this word. Oh my God, I love everything about this word. Not just what it signifies, but the actual, the actual sound of it. The fact that the C and the T just, just cushion the mmm sound into this monosyllabic that you can just spit like a bullet, or you can extend it out and roll it around your mouth. Cunt. I love its dexterity. I love the fact that in Scotland it's a term of endearment. But in America, it's horrendously offensive. I love it means something different with your friends than it does if you said it to your boss, it would probably cost you your job. I do not recommend it. I love this word. <laughs> I love the fact that the first three letters are still the same chalice shape, all rolling through the word until they're stopped in that plosive T at the end. I think the thing that I love most about it is its status as the nastiest of all the nasty words. Although that title is under some contention now, there are other obvious heavyweight contenders for the most offensive word. The N-word, for example. But here's what I would say to you. I know why that word is offensive. I can look at the history. That word enabled the brutalization and racial genocide of an entire group of people. It played its part in dehumanizing black people. What did cunt do? <laughs> Does it not strike anyone else as odd that a word that just means the vulva could even be regarded in the same league of offense as the N-word. Are we saying that vulvas are that offensive? Surely not. But what I want to talk to you today about is how did we get here? Has it always been this offensive? And how did it come to be so? The answer is no, it was not. But let's look at the history of it first of all. Where in the cunt does cunt come from? It's one of those words that's so old, etymologists and linguists, kind of, they, kind of, they lose sight of it eventually. It's the oldest word for the vulva that we have in the English language. It might even be the oldest in the world. There are some theories. There are also similar cognitions in Germanic languages all across Europe. So the Vikings would be talking about kunters, the Germans had kunto, Dutch, kont, Germanic kot, and I think at one point we had kot, which I think may be due for a revival. After that, it gets a bit confusing as to what this word actually means. One of the leading theories is that it shares this root, this Proto-Indo-European root with this gen sound, which you also see in genetics, gene, and that means to create. Another theory is that it comes from this sound, gun, which gives us woman gynecology, create, woman. But what really fascinates linguists is this sound, the coo sound, because that gave us cunt, and it also gave us cunning. Cunning originally didn't mean sneaky. It meant you knew something. Cunning folk, cunning women were wise women. And in Scotland still today, if you ken something, it means you know something. I ken this. It also gave us queen and cow, slightly bizarre, which is slightly less highbrow, but it turns up again in the Middle Ages, in quent, which means knowledge and also means cunt. It has a Latin variation as well, cunis, which also means cunt, which is, turns up all over the Roman world, including in graffiti on, in Pompeii. Some of my favorite Roman graffiti from the city of Pompeii, I won't try and do the Latin, but it's translated to be, a hairy cunt is better fucked than a smooth one. <laughs> it wants cock and holds in steam. There you go. However, I put it to you that the word cunt, as offensive as it may be today, stems from it's a root that means woman, knowledge, create, cow. Has it always been this offensive? No. 
But we'll talk about this. So when we talk about these words, vulva, vagina, trying to offer more palatable alternatives to cunt. Vagina, the word turns up in the 17th century. It's taken directly from Latin, and it means a scabbard. It means something that a sword goes into. Vulva doesn't do much better. That appears in the 14th century, and it means womb, but some people have suggested it comes from the French and means wrapper. Both these words derive their, their meaning and their import from the penis, basically. That's what a vagina is. It's something a sword goes into. I say that these words aren't as feminist as cunt, which comes from a word that means queen, create, wisdom, cow. But when did it first start being used in English as we recognize it today? Grope Cunt Lane. This is the first recorded incident in the Oxford English Dictionary. It turns up in 1230, a street name in London called Grope Cunt Lane, which was exactly what it sounds like. This was in the red light district of Southwark. It was a lane for groping cunts. And there wasn't just one in London. There was one in Bristol. There was one in York. It appears all over the British Isles. Here it is. There's the one in Bristol. It's like Oxford. There it is, just in blue. But whereas Glaswegians might be calling each other and their friends cunts, it seems that medieval people were calling their children cunts because it turns up in a number of names, bizarrely enough. Gladwin Claw Cunt is recorded in 1066, Guernica Cuntles in 1219, John Phil Cunt in 1246, Robert Cleave Cunt 1302, and a Miss Belle Wide Cunt turns up in the Norfolk subsidiary role. We don't know if these are aliases or if they're jokes, but we do have a lot of fun with medieval names. In fact, originally the word fuck did not mean what it means today. It means to strike something to hit, which gives us the fabulous name of a dairy farmer in 1290 who's known as Simon Fuck Butter. <laughs> so was this offensive to medieval people? No, it wasn't. Cunts turn up all over medieval culture and medieval literature, and they are certainly not offensive, it's just a descriptive term. Here's some examples. The Proverbs of Hending from 1325 advises women to give your cunt cunningly and make your demands later, i.e. get a ring on it first before you give it up. There's a Welsh poet called Gwerthin McCain from the 15th century, and she advises uh, male poets to celebrate the fine, bright curtain of a cunt that flaps in place of greeting. It might surprise us that medieval culture was this open about cunts, but the truth was that they were more sexually liberated than we actually give them credit for. This idea of them being in a tower with a chastity belt on is largely a hatchet job on their reputation done by the Victorians. Now, it wasn't a sexually liberated utopia. They had their own hang-ups, but they weren't that offended by sex. What would get you in trouble, swear words in the Middle Ages, was religious ones, blasphemous ones. If you said something like God's wounds or God's teeth, that's what you'd say if you caught your, thing, your fly in the, uh, your soft and danglies in your fly. One, middle uh, blah, blah, blah. One medieval poet who drops the sea bomb with the precision of a military drone is this chap. Geoffrey Chaucer, who turns up in GCSEs and A-level syllabuses, although his cunt jokes are generally not dwelled upon. This is his joke. He doesn't use the word cunt. He uses the word quenta here, which again means knowledge and it means cunt. So this is his joke. As the clerk's been full subtle, uh, full here quenta, and privily he caught her by the quenta. A rough translation means the clerk was really cunning and he caught her by the cunt. Shakespeare. It's been suggestion that he uses that play, a quaint, quenta, cunt, in his, sonnet, in his sonnet number 20. Here he is. It certainly turns up in a lot of his work. It's a lot ruder than we often give him credit for. In Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 2, Hamlet says to Ophelia, he says, shall I lie in your lap? And she says, oh, no, my lord. And then he says, do you think I meant country matters? When David Tennant played that part, he paused on her. Do you think I meant country matters? to try and really drive it home. Another one, Twelfth Night Malvolio, says of his mistress's handwriting, there be her sees her use her teas, and that thus she makes her very great peas, punning on cunt and piss simultaneously. The immortal bard's status as a smut peddler is often swept under the cultural rug. In, seven, uh, in 1807, Thomas Boulder published The Family Shakespeare, where he edited out all of these jokes, all of the rude bits, and made it a completely cunt-free affair. It's no surprise that about this time, 
we start to get the first libel laws in Britain, the first uh, banning of seditious and offensive pamphlets with the rise of Puritanism. For Shakespeare to be veiling his cunt jokes in kind of cheeky double entendres suggests that it's not quite as free and open as Guernica Kuntles on Grope Cunt Lane would once have had. The Puritans repressed sexuality, we know this, and language is an extremely important battleground for sexual liberation. How do you talk about your bodies if the very words that you're trying to use are considered to be offensive? How do you do that? And by the time we get to the restoration period, the early modern period, cunt is most certainly offensive. And this chap here, John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester, is the absolute poster boy of fuck you. If the Puritans tried to dam up sexuality, this guy surfed to notoriety on a wave of sexual repression that was unleashed when the plug was pulled on the Puritan rule. He uses cunt a lot, and he's very naughty about it. He wrote this poem about his mistress and how jealous he was of her other lovers. When your lewd cunt came spewing home, drenched with the seed of half the town, my dram of sperm was supped up after for the digestive surfeit water, full gorged another time with a vast meal of slime, which your devouring cunt, oh, missed one, hath drawn from porter's backs and footman's brawn. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> he uses that word to shock, and it's easy to look at his work and think that he's sexually liberated, but he's actually quite angry at cunts and their owners, and that goes all the way through it. From here on out, cunt is an offensive, naughty word. Georgian cunts, here we go. <laughs> I'll just let that settle. So what happens about the 18th century is the print industry really explodes. And of course, we being humans, we didn't just want to publish nice books. We published porn, yay! <laughs> There's a huge proliferation of porn that comes out of the 18th century, but oddly enough, most of it shies away from using that word cunt. In 1785, Francis Gross published his book, A Dictionary of a Vulgar Tongue, which is basically a dictionary of slang, and he defined cunt as a nasty name for a nasty thing. Such modesty from someone who also uh, uses the word buccaneer's boot, lobster pot, scut, and uh, Mrs. Frubb's parlor for the vulva. This book here, Harris's List, this is an almanac, this is a directory of sex workers in London at the time who were selling sex, and it lists not only their address and their prices, but very, very intimate descriptions of what they do and their vulvas, but it doesn't use cunt very much. This one here, this is an illustration, fabulous illustration, from Fanny Hill, what's often called the first pornographic novel, which was published in 1748 by John Cleland, who famously boasted that he did it without writing any rude words at all. These texts tend to use expressions like mossy grot, Cupid's coal hole, Venus's mound, but we shy away from cunt. Victorian, so despite their reputation for being sexually prudish, Pornography flowed underneath Victoria upper crust society like a river of slime in Ghostbusters 2. They had pornography all over the place, visual and literary, and they had a lot of fun with cunt. One of their pornographic magazines, The Pearl, was published from 1879 to 1880, and it published in it nursery rhymes every, every month. I've got some here for you to have a look at. There was a young lady of Hitchin who was scratching her cunt in the kitchen. Her father said, Rose, it's the crabs, I suppose. You're right, pa, the buggers are itching. <laughs> there was a young man of Bombay who fashioned a cunt out of clay, but the heat of his prick turned it into a brick and it chafed all his foreskin away. <laughs> yeah, well done, Victorians, well done. Interestingly, it's also in the 19th century that we get the first recorded use of cunt being used as an insult, as an actual, you are a cunt. That's the first time that it's used in the 19th century. It, in the 17th century, we start it being used as a kind of a, a derogatory collective noun for women. Samuel Pepys writes about this aphrodisiac that's going to make all the cunts chase after him. Charming. That's when they weren't stabbing him with pins for being too sexually aggressive. Anyway, the Victorians liked a well-placed cunt. One of the most important cunt moments in history is this, is the um, publication and the subsequent obscenity trial of Lady Chatterley's lover. 
This book contained 14 cunts and 40 fucks, and it was banned, and it had to go on trial in order to be published. And it was shocking not just because the graphic scenes of sex and the, and the language used, but because it smashes down class boundaries. If you're not familiar with this, it's about Lady Constance Chatterley, a married woman who um, embarks on an affair with, with Sean Bean here, uh, but with Mel as the gamekeeper. And the idea is that it doesn't matter all her airs and graces and titles, she's got a cunt, she's a sexual woman, and that levels them. But one of the pivotal scenes is where Mellors tries to tell her what cunt means. I won't do the accent. Uh, nay, nay, fuck's only what animals do, but cunt's a lot more than that. It's thee, just thou see, thou's a lot more beside an animal, aren't thou? Even to fuck, cunt, eh, that's the beauty of thee, lass. Cunt, that's the beauty of thee, lass. I love that. Now, Despite a jury that agreed a work stuffed full of cunts does have artistic merit, and they allowed it to be published, and you can see the pictures of the people queuing around the streets to get their hands on this book, once it was, cunt never really made it back into the mainstream. Feminists have maintained a rather uneasy relationship with cunt. This is Judy Chicago. She led what was called the cunt art movement of the 1970s. It first turned up in a film a mainstream cinema in 1971 in Carnal Knowledge with Jack Nicholson, who screamed at a woman that she is a bulb busting son of a cunt bitch, or words to that effect, and in The Exorcist as well. It appears in the Vagina Monologues, 1996, I think it was, with Eva Ensler when she talks about reclaiming cunt, but it's still not off the linguistic naughty step, despite all of this work. Cunts today. It was. It was finally admitted to the Oxford English Dictionary, despite having been around for thousands of years in the 70s. And then in 2014, they relented a little bit more and they added cunty, cuntish, cunted, cunting. So we all know exactly what that means. The Ofcom, the uh, regulator for UK TV censorship, in 2016, released a poll of what they regarded to be the most offensive words, and cunt was bang up there. It was on top. It is still regarded as a horrendously offensive word. But here's what I want to leave you with. What do you call yours? Because as far as I can see, words for vulva or cunts fall into a few categories. We've got childlike, a tuppence, a twinkie, a foo for minky, a mary. Very medical, a vulva pedendum, vagina, slightly detached, down there, it's down there, <laughs> bits, special area, violent, axe wound, penis fly trap, gash or a growler. Someone told me, well, the taxi driver on my way in told me that it's Glaswegian slang for cunnilingus is growling at the badger, which <laughs> I'll leave that with you. Or they just tend to be unpleasant. Horrible images of fish and meat and general putrescence, fish taco, bacon sandwich, badly stuffed kebab, bearded clam, etc., etc. Are these better alternatives to cunt? But I think the reason that we're not prepared and we can't handle cunt is because we can't handle cunts generally. While it's been linguistically sanitized, culturally, the only cunts we seem to be okay with are ones that have been plucked and buffed and waxed and glued, covered in glitter. It's a vajazzle, by the way. <laughs> the vagina plaster business is booming. You can have your labia cut off, you can have your hymen rebuilt, you can have your pelvic floor resprung. Are we this uncomfortable with the cunt actually as it is? It's a seat of enormous and awesome power. It can eat a penis and push out a baby. It's not a twinkle. <laughs> it is an old word. It's an offensive word, but it's an ancient and honest one. And this is the thing. This is the original word. Everything else came after. So welcome to Team Cunt.